In this lecture, we will take as a case study the state of Ohio to examine the history of American abolitionism. Ohio, a free state, nonetheless had a very complicated history of racism and discrimination. At the same time, it was known for having some of the most famous abolitionist leaders. In the period before the Civil War, African Americans did not have the right to vote in Ohio. They could not serve on juries and could not testify against whites. African Americans were banned from militia service. Uh, migrant blacks were legally obligated to post a $500 bond upon entry into the state, and they had to prove their status as free men or free persons. Ohio enforced segregated education in many cities during the 19th century, and even in cities like Toledo, where there were not formal white schools and black schools, um, the lack of formal segregation was only due to the fact that the city didn't have the money to build separate schools, and they had uh, African Americans were forced who attended schools in non-segregated communities like Toledo um, did not get the same education. There were significant tensions between poor whites and African Americans at the time. Poor whites tended to fear that African Americans would take their jobs or have a deleterious effect on wages in the area, and occasionally Africans suffered terror attacks at the hands of white attackers. This is pre-KKK days, and yet the same phenomenon occurred. Um, so this was a state, Ohio, where African Americans before the Civil War were free and yet unfree. Early efforts at abolitionism tended to focus on the forced migration of African Americans uh, back to Africa, although in the case of African Americans whose ancestors had been here for centuries, they had as little in common with Africa as they might with China or uh, Denmark, for that matter. The American Colonization Society, which was formed in 1817, argued for repatriation to Africa. The uh, nation of Liberia got its start after 15,000 freed blacks had been transported back to West Africa. So this was the, the early focused of, focus of uh, abolition efforts in the United States. Benjamin Lundy was a Quaker abolitionist who moved to Ohio in 1814. He is perhaps best known for an influential newspaper he created called the Genius of Universal Emancipation, which was published from 1821 to 1839. didn't have tremendous um, circulation numbers, uh, but it was highly influential. It had strong anti-slavery views, but like many other abolitionists of the time, it advocated repatriation to Africa. Interestingly, at one point, uh, Lundy hired the famed abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison as newspaper editor, editor Garrison, very young at this time. Lane Theological Seminary was founded in Cincinnati in 1829 for the purposes of training Presbyterian ministers. The school, however, became quickly a hotbed of radical abolitionism, perhaps in part due to the fact it was so close to the Ohio River, which at that time was a traditional border between a free state and a slave state. The seminary's first president was Lyman Beecher, a noted abolitionist writer. In 1834, the school sponsored a series of debates on abolitionism that gained notoriety in the region and uh, across the nation. Part of the background to the debates was Turner's Rebellion in 1831, Nat Turner uh, leading a notorious slave uprising that worried quite a few white Americans who feared that another Haitian-style revolution might occur with widespread bloodshed. This was a series of 18 days worth of debates and seminars featuring a wide spectrum of speakers ranging from colonization proponents to abolitionists. Uh, due to its location in a religious institution, in some ways this was more like a revival meeting than a political event. Simultaneously, Lane Seminary students began outreach work among local blacks, helping them learn to read, helping them find employment. Uh, unfortunately, this made Cincinnati civic and business leaders very nervous, and they pressured the school to close the debates. These so-called Lane rebels left in protest of this action. <clears throat> 
A leader of the Lane Rebels was future abolitionist leader Theodore Dwight Weld, who had a long career in abolitionism, although he's kept a rather low pri profile in comparison with some abolitionists. He's perhaps most famous for the book American Slavery as It Is, Testimony of a Thousand Witnesses, which was published in 1839. Weld uh, painstakingly collected eyewitness accounts from ex-slaves, slave merchants, and former slave owners to paint an extremely negative picture of the horrors of slavery. Weld and his fellow rebels were eventually accepted by Oberlin College, which is in northern Ohio, not far from Cleveland. Lyman Beecher, again president of Lane Seminary, was put in a rather difficult position, um, being caught as he was in the middle between the radical abolitionists and colonization uh, advocates. Um, he later wrote that he felt guilty uh, for not taking a stronger stand against slavery at the time, but again, he, he uh, viewed slavery as best to end gradually rather than immediate um, abolition of slavery as the radical abolitionists wanted. Oberlin College, which is located in northern Ohio, not far from present-day Cleveland, was the first American institution of higher learning to admit female and black students. The town of, of Oberlin is sometimes known as the town that started the Civil War due to the many abolitionists associated with the college and several important events, one of which we'll talk about in a moment. Students of the college were involved in the famous Oberlin Wellington rescue case that achieved a national attention. John Price was a runaway slave who was arrested in Oberlin under the Fugitive Slave Law, which allowed federal marshals to enter a free state to capture a runaway slave who came from a slave state. After being taken to a jail in nearby Wellington, Ohio, rescuers took him by force from U.S. Marshals. The rescuers led Price back to Oberlin and then directed him to freedom in Canada. There were a total of 37 indictments and uh, a mere two convictions came out of this, both of whom received relatively short sentences as a result of the trials. A lot of significant national attention on the case as this was a major test of the effectiveness of the Fugitive Slave Act and the willingness of the federal government to actually enforce this law. Uh, on a side note, unfortunately for John Price, he died soon after traveling to freedom in Canada. This is an image of the rescuers after they were freed from jail wearing what looks to be their Sunday best. Harriet Beecher Stowe was the daughter of Lyman Beecher, president of Lane Seminary. And she's most famous for her impassioned uh, anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The book was inspired in part by Theodore Dwight, Dwell's, Dwight Weld's American Slavery as it is. Some of the scenes depicted in there um, were first depicted in Weld's book. Stowe had many connections with abolitionists and underground railroad activists in Ohio. This best-selling book was first published in Cleveland and 300,000 copies of the book were sold in the first year. By comparison, Uncle Tom's Cabin was second only to the Bible in terms of sales for over a decade. And uh, when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe during the Civil War, he smiled and allegedly called her the little lady who started the big war. Um, we know this on a legendary sort of basis. Uh, however, documentation for this quote uh, doesn't begin to appear for a few decades after the Civil War. So there's some debate among um, scholars as to whether or not Lincoln actually said that. But it's the kind of thing he probably would have said had he met her um, at that time. This is a scanned image of the front cover of a first edition copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin. In 1840, a group of Cincinnati abolitionists formed the Liberty Party, which advocated working within a system to end slavery. However, the methods of the Liberty Party were not aggressive enough for radical abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison, who publicly burned a copy of the Constitution in 1844, calling it a covenant with death, and agreement with hell. The Liberty Party received 2.3% uh, of the vote in 1844. It was later absorbed by the Free Soil Party in 1848. 
The Free Soil Party, of course, being one of the factions that would become the new Republican Party in the 1850s. The Liberty Party ran James G. Burney of Ohio as a presidential candidate in 1840 and 1844. Bernie, a noted abolitionist, although something of a gradualist as they go. In 1851, Ohio voters went to the polls to uh, ratify a new state constitution. Unfortunately, Ohioans overwhelmingly rejected black suffrage or the right to vote for African Americans, and African Americans thus continued to be free but unfree in Ohio despite the state's lengthy history of abolitionist activity. They missed an opportunity to be truly progressive. Here we have a map of the Underground Railroad routes. Ohio was a very important region for the Underground Railroad, which was an informal network of people who helped escaped slaves travel to freedom. Part of this is geographic, uh, being as close as it was to slave states in Virginia and uh, Kentucky. And the Ohio River, again, had been a traditional border between free and slave states. Uh, part of it also, though, reflects um, the strong abolitionist movement in Ohio prior to the Civil War.